Okay, so a couple years ago, I stood up here um, and we were talking about the generations in a lot more detail. And the question back then, a few years ago, was where is everyone? We couldn't seem to find people to hire. And the question was, where is everyone? Fast forward a couple years now, and the question has shifted a little bit. It's no longer where is everyone, but where is everyone going, right? We can't seem to hold on to our talent. So the question has shifted. And I've been fortunate enough to work with a lot of companies over the past few years. Uh, my background is in recruitment. And so what I've found in, in my research, in my research working with these companies, is there's a loss of this human component, okay, across the board. We've lost this human component. And it's funny, because in 2023, we're probably the most connected that we've ever been. And yet somehow also very disconnected with each other. Okay, so a lot of what we're gonna to speak today has to do with rehumanizing. Rehumanizing our processes, rehumanizing our systems, really just rehumanizing ourselves and our mindsets. Okay? Now, if you bear with me for a second, what that's gonna, what you're gonna need to do in this room is come at this with open hearts and open minds. All right, can you guys do that with me? Ready? Open hearts, open minds. Uh, you guys, one more time. Open hearts, open minds. All right, we're cooking. We need some more coffee in this room. All right, All right so what's gonna happen now is uh, the reason I ask you for open hearts and open minds is because we're gonna talk a lot about the future here today. And what the future is going to need from you is a lot of changes. I'm gonna make some assumptions. And the reality of retention is, retention is gonna start with you. Retention is gonna start with us in this room. So my assumptions in this room is that there are a lot of decision makers in here, key decision makers. And if maybe you aren't the key decision maker, you're very close to someone in your organization that is. And that's good, because again, retention starts with you. So I'm gonna pose a question here. Out of 100 people, in any given year, for any given reason, out of 100 people, how many do you think you lose just because? How many out of 100? Go ahead, shut this out. This is the audience collaboration one. I'm sorry? 64. That's a good one. We're off to the races. All right. 64 out of 100, you're going to lose no matter what. What else do I have? Any other guesses? 15? 71. 71? Okay. Uh, guys, it's actually 27 people. All right. Which is still a lot. 27 people out of 100, you're gonna lose over the course of the year just because they woke up one morning and they were like, I'm good. <laughs> I don't wanna do this anymore. 27 out of 100, that's 27%. That's a lot. And they were probably thinking, okay, the cards are already stacked against us, so what do we do, Rob? How do we fix this? How do we retain the policy? I got you, I got you. I'm gonna give you my personal formula. And if you're gonna write this down, now would be the time to write this down, okay? The formula is very simple and I guarantee You've heard this term before. I guarantee it. The formula is year over year. You can write this as a fraction. Year over year. And if you wrote it as a fraction, go ahead and scratch off your numerator because you wrote it wrong. It's an acronym, okay? Y E E E R over year. Year over year, okay? I came up with it, it's rudimentary. I apologize, but it works. It works. Year over year, if you, the why, the people in this room, if you can evolve, empathize, and engage, then you will retain. All right, one more time. Y E E E R, Y triple E R, over the course of a year, normal Y E A R. If you can engage, first E, empathize, second E, and evolve, your third E, you will retain. That's it. And this is the agenda for the rest of today, by the way. I got 40 minutes to dump my brain into your brain. All right? So, year over year. And I'll dive into each of these E's and exactly how it plays into retention. Let's talk about your workforce system. Anyone self-employed in here? I'm just a couple of be great. Sir, if I ask you, Describe to me your workforce system. And by that, I mean your organizational structure. How would you describe that to me? Uh, corporation. Sure. And in your corporation, what does that structure look like? Uh, myself as president, I have a COO, and then 11 employees. 11 employees, and some middle management in between, I'm assuming? Perfect. Your name? Matthew. Matthew, and your industry? Uh, insurance. Matthew from insurance described his organizational structure, his workforce system, President, CEO, C-suite executives, some middle management, 
and then the rest of his staff. Right? Raise your hand if that's pretty much the structure that you work in. Just about everybody, right? That, what Matt just described is a traditional workforce system, a traditional organization, very linear, very hierarchy-based. And I would imagine 90 to 95% of this room falls under that category, very traditional workforce system, very, very linear, or so you think. Or so you think. Where we are headed and where you might already be is more of a workforce ecosystem. And I'm gonna explain this to you in a second. Let's talk evolution. Evolution. Not that kind of evolution, workforce evolution, the world of work. One thing we know for sure is that the world of work has evolved. It is continuing to evolve, and it will keep evolving. So we have to evolve with it. In 2020, MIT and Deloitte got together and they started studying the future of work. And they did this by interviewing thousands of business executives across the globe. I'm talking thousands, 3,000 plus of the top business executives across the world. A lot of that data is what I'm gonna share with you today. And what they found was the most successful business leaders are already making, taking advantage of this new interconnected workforce. Really an interconnected world, okay? What that looks like is the, the term ecosystem itself implies several connected systems, several components. But let's define the ecosystem really quickly. When you define ecosystem, you're all working towards a collective goal, but you're including internal contributors, your staff, as well as external contributors. A lot of the times we forget we may have external contributors. And so what Matt described is a traditional workforce structure, that pyramid that's on your right. Okay, your C-suite exec CEOs, presidents, whatever, your middle management, your operations management, your directors, your supervisors, and then your staff. Very traditional, very linear but chances are you're already operating in an ecosystem, okay? You have external contributors, meaning you have short-term tenants, you have long-term contractual workers, you have service providers, you have uh, software companies. All of these external contributors all working together towards your collective business goals. I want you to take a moment here. Are you in the ecosystem? Chances are yes. You are already in the ecosystem. Okay. The key here to remember, this is not, by the way, outsourcing. Okay, Outsourcing is different. I'll give you an example. When we outsource, we set it and forget it. Right. Most of the time, it's usually customer support, tech support. It was, I was on tech support the other day, and I got off the phone 10 minutes later because I had the idea that, dude, I don't think you know what this company even does. All right. So I, that's the difference between internal and external contributors. You're involving everybody. You're making sure that you're setting a unified experience for all of your contributors. But we can't talk about this, this complex ecosystem without introducing a new concept. And that new concept is workforce orchestration. Not management, not workforce management, workforce orchestration. Okay, think of a conductor leading an orchestra, very fluid, very back and forth. That's what we're talking about here. An ecosystem, a complex several part system doesn't allow for traditional management. It just doesn't. Because a lot of those external contributors may not fall under any one particular management at all. So you have to orchestrate. The term management itself implies authority. It implies control. It implies rigidity. But orchestration, that's different. Orchestration implies collaboration, support, autonomy, autonomy. One key word you're gonna take away from this. Autonomy is actually what the future of your workforce is killing to have right now. Autonomy, independence, creativity. Let me do what I do best and leave me alone. Give me the goal, let me achieve it. Autonomy. All right, so again, the key here is workforce orchestration, not management. In the survey, 80% of executives agreed that hey, we need to include our external contributors into the culture of our organization. And yet 45% of them were even successful at doing this. This is a work in progress. Evolution doesn't happen overnight. You're not gonna solve this new leadership mindset shift overnight. This is gonna take practice. You're turning your company on its head. 
in a lot of instances if you're not all the way there yet. So this requires leadership changes, HR changes. You're shedding the boundaries of your traditional roles. You're becoming, you're giving yourself access to a boundaryless world when you incorporate your external contributors. What does that mean? That means new ways to acquire talent, new ways to measure performance, new ways to deal with your staff. And you can leverage technology to do all of this. And by the way, if you're feeling a little overwhelmed right now, over a third of the companies that were surveyed, top global companies, even got any ounce of this correct. So you're not alone, all right? Don't freak out, okay? And a lot of the companies already admitted that 30% of their work is already being handled by external contributors. So 30% of our company, we're already there. Some of you might have been in this room when I said you already have external contributors. You're already doing this. On the bottom, I have different strokes for different folks. Your external contributors are going to contribute to different organizational goals. They bring different skill sets to your organization. They have different needs. Again, the key here is to make this as inclusive and uniform as possible. I'll give you some examples. If you've never heard of Nova Artis, Nova Artis is a global pharmaceutical company. They do billions of dollars in revenue every year. They have 100,000 internal workers, roughly, 50,000 external workers, roughly. What they could have done, they were going through an organizational change. What they could have done is split their 150,000 employees into hundreds of departments and then have hired 100 different managers to manage them. Instead, what they did was they took their 100 managers and lumped them all together. Are you with me? They lumped them all together under one umbrella, the people and organizational umbrella to manage all internal and external contributors together. One simplified vision, one simplified experience. I'll give you another example. Has anyone here worked for Walt Disney World? Anybody? One person in the back. You are not a Walt Disney World employee. You are a cast member. Thank you very much. Okay. Even if you're a third party agent, a TPA, you're still considered a participating cast member. Everybody goes through the same orientation. Everybody learns the same history of Disney. That is a unified experience, internal and external contributors. Does this make sense? Are you with me so far? Okay. All right, so assuming we have evolved, we've achieved evolution. Fantastic, go us. Um, you're now getting to your second E, which is empathy. This is where things get interesting. Raise your hand if you have an idea of what generation you belong to. And by judging by the mentee, it seems like you do. Okay? All right, so let's get into this a little bit. So probably the most jarring fact that came out of this statistic, there's a little, almost 100 people in here. Assuming we are all in HR for just one second, let's assume everybody in here is in HR and there's 100 of us in here. If I ask you how many of you feel comfortable dealing with millennials or other generations, you know how many hands would go up right now? Zero? Close. Four. Four hands would go up right now. When surveyed, HR professionals, 4%. These are your people's people! This is your people department! And they're saying only 4% are confident to dealing with millennials and other generations. There's a disconnect here, people. This is why you're losing people. Your people's department can't manage their people. Okay? I can't draw this enough. God, what is going on? Hello? Okay? We need to address this problem. By the year 2030, your workforce, the bulk of your workforce is going to be X, Y, and Z. Generation X, Generation Y, Generation Z. That's it. If you haven't figured out the generations by now, we are in deep trouble. Okay? Now there's about 40, 45% of Gen X in here when we were doing that survey. And in your, in, by the year 2030, that number dips to about 25%. And that's because Generation X does what I like to call a hard sell. They're no longer working well into their retirement age. All right? Millennials are about 40%, and Gen Z will be about 35%. Um, I saw we have some more Gen Zs with us. Gen Z, where are you at? One, two, three, four. Okay, let's welcome Gen Z to the table. Hello, Gen Z. Last time we did this, you know how many Gen Z I had? I had 
have one Gen Z here. Nice to have you guys with us. All right, so let's back up a little bit. <clears throat> what do we know about baby boomers? Shout it out, go ahead, anything. They're old. They're old. <laughs> <laughs> she said it, not me. They're, ti they're tired, they're starting to retire. Okay, what else do we know? They're knowledgeable. They know it all. They know it all, don't they? Or they think they do. All right, so that's pretty good. That's pretty good, that's a pretty good start. How about millennials? What do we know about millennials? They know it all. They know it all. <laughs> we definitely know it all, you're right. Uh, what else? They don't know how to use a fax machine. We don't know how to use a fax machine? We don't know. Well, what else do we know? I'll take one more thing. It's a good thing I put on my thick skin today. We're tech savvy. We're tech savvy. Okay, that's positive. I like that. I like that. We're making you know, TikToks toxic kind of you're getting, some, you're getting some confusion between some generations. Yeah, let's go to Gen Z. All right, what do we know about Gen Z? Hold on a second. What is it? They're creative. I like that. What else? Social They're socially <laughs> conscious. Ooh, you must be the doctor. You are the doctor. All right. What else do we know about Gen Z? They were, they were always born with a cell phone. They're always born with a cell phone. This is not fair, Christina. You've heard me speak before. All right. <laughs> that is correct. That's very correct. They don't know life before the end. All right. I'm forgetting a generation here. Apologies to Generation X. Yes, yes, Generation X. What do we know about Generation X? They're the best. I'm so sick of Generation X. What do we know about Generation X? They're the forgotten. You're right. I'm sorry? They're pioneers. They're pioneers. Okay. They're flexible. Look at all these positives all of a sudden. What? They're highly independent. Absolutely. Okay, you guys know your stuff. You guys know your stuff. But it's important to do that. The reason I do this is because we have to understand the people that we work with. It's easy to roll your eyes and say, okay, Boomer, you don't understand anything. You're lying. Your ideas are outdated. You know, we don't do things like this anymore. It's easy to do that. But guess what? They have a lot of knowledge. They have a lot of experience. They bring value to your company. You're here. You're here. <laughs> All right. So right. One of the, it's easy to say, oh, you're millennials. You're all a bunch of snowflakes. How sensitive. You're lazy and entitled. Yes. Yes. It's easy to do that. But as we're, as we're going to go through this thing, we might shed some info as to why we are the way we are. So if you're a baby boomer right now, somewhere between the age of 59 and 77, and you are labeled the workaholic generation, right? You're also labeled the pull yourself up by the bootstraps generation. Well, listen, that might have been easy to do when boots were $5. Boots are now $500, okay? Um, so as, you know, baby boomers, they, they live to work. Work is life. Their identity, or again, generalization, a lot of the time they are tied to their work. They're very loyal to their, to their employees, to their, to their employers, to themselves, okay? This is the generation that knows how to work. A lot of the structures that we have today, revolving work, comes from this generation. And they've seen a lot of history, right? Beatlemania, you know, the space race, Vietnam. They, they've seen a lot of it, okay? They've been through a lot of it. Now, we're going to talk about communication a lot. Communi I bring up communication for a couple reasons. The way I communicate with my HR and my IT team might be through email, and that might work for them. It probably does. The way I communicate with my frontline staff or, say, I don't know, my warehousing staff, cannot be through email, should not be through email. They're too busy for email. I might need to communicate with them through a morning debrief, okay? Your mode of communication here is crucial to get the message across. And for baby boomers, that's gonna happen face-to-face -face or probably over the phone, all right? When we talk about what they prioritize, they prioritize these things. They prioritize work. They prioritize structure and hierarchy. We know these things. Now again, if you're looking to attract baby boomers to your workforce and keep them, and keep them, what you're going to need to do is check in with them. See what kind of roles they're looking for currently, okay? Chances are they may be ready for a change, or they may be ready to take on something new completely. Maybe they're ready for roles of mentorship or consulting. Or, I'm sorry? More? Oh. <laughs> I heard more and I was like, excuse me? How much more we got? Right? <clears throat> All right? So check in with them, see where they're at. And then if you're going to, if they are willing to take on something else, develop them further. You can develop them a lot further, right? 
Chances are they've been at your company 10, 20, 30, 40 years. They know your staff and they know your stuff. Involve them in workforce planning. Involve them in succession planning. They probably have identified other people that are good at what they do. Involve them. Maybe they need some technical skills training, so you can do that as well. When it comes to Gen X, Generation X in here, anywhere from 44 to 58 years old. Hello, AARP, how's it going? I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. All right, you are generation independent. You know this. You know this. You're the lock and key generation. Here's the keys. Lock the door. I'll be home later after work. Okay. MTV was your babysitting. Right. Cartoons for breakfast. Okay. This is the generation that grew up very independent. You're also the generation, the very first generation, to start experiencing more and more parental divorce. This is why you grew up more independent, probably. All right. You also went through a lot of history, a lot of revolution from Y2K to the fall of the Berlin Wall, right? a lot of technological revolution, beepers to cell phones, from tapes to CDs, okay? You are very comfortable with probably all modes of communication, okay? Phone, email, face-to-face, -face, you do it all. Fantastic, good for you, all right? Gen X. No, I jest, I really like Gen X. And actually statistics prove that. Gen X, for whatever reason, meshes really well with both Millennials and Gen Z. I don't know why, but that's just the way it is. We work very well together. And if we're gonna be the bulk of the workforce, things are gonna be all right, okay? Now for Generation X, if you're looking to attract Generation X, chances are they've been at your company for a long time too, and they've been working their butts off, all right? 10 years, 15 years, they've been there, they're most of the grindstone, they've been working hard. They are primed for the next step, for the next step in leadership, orchestration, okay? They are ready for it. And they love learning, we know this. So if you wanna develop your Generation X talent, and you should be in order to be keeping them, what you can do here is give them more professional development and leadership opportunities. Give them more chances to succeed, okay? They love it, they will eat it up, and they will perform for you. We know they're hard workers. But leave them alone, let them do it, okay? This is the generation that prioritizes informality, right? Excuse me, what are my instructions? Fantastic, leave please, thank you. All right. That's it. When it comes to millennials, guys, we're no longer the kids everybody thinks we are, right? We're having kids of our own. Most of my generation is in our 30s and 40s. When did that happen? Jesus. All right, 30 and 40. We're having kids of our own. My generation, there's <laughs> a lot we can say about my generation. We get talked down to a lot, right? We, we take the brunt of it, and that's okay, because we're resilient. We're generation resilient. We're also generation stressed. And a lot of people make fun of us even further generation Y, as in generation Y, do you exist? Generation Y, are you burning down all of our industries? You know, the list goes on. But the real fact of the matter is my generation, the bulk of my generation graduated college in a recession. One of the biggest recessions. 08, 09, 010. That's where we graduated. You know what was happening to the economy? In the, in the, you know, use the word, okay? So that's where we graduate. We're the concept. I give my, give my generation a different name. We're generation catch up. We're trying to catch up. And if that means we're a little bit entitled, or if that means we want things with instant gratification, it's because we're trying to catch up. We have gotten left behind. My my generation, when we graduated, there were no jobs. We were underemployed or unemployed. And so what do we do? We went back to school. Took on a crap ton of more debt, and here we are now. And life has only gotten more expensive. Okay, so we're trying to catch up. How you're gonna attract your generational talent? This is one generation that responds very well to money, honey. Okay, very well to money. Okay, we're also gonna respond very well to benefits because again, we're trying to catch up, all right? Now, how you're gonna communicate with us? We can do everything. We don't prefer face-to-face, -face, but we'll do it, all right? Text is preferred. Email, preferred as well. Um, and phone. You can just again get us on the phone, fantastic. You'll probably get a voicemail that says, please text me. <laughs> Gen Z. Does my Gen Z again make some noise? All right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> my social anxiety won't let me. Yes, yes I understand. <laughs> I get you, Gen Z. I get you. Right. Gen Z, um, anywhere from, what is it, 12? 11. 11 to 26 years old right now. Prime time, graduating college, getting ready to enter the workforce. Welcome. All right. <laughs> Gen, this is the generation, who said it in the back? Christine said it, I think. This is the first generation to not know life before the internet. They don't know life before the internet. 
But they've had a hard life so far. Keep in mind, this is the generation that has dealt with school shooting after school shooting after school shooting over and over and over. This is your activist generation. And it shouldn't be uh, a surprise because guess who their parents are? Gen X, okay? Rocking and rolling over here, all right? This is your activist generation. If something's wrong, they'll let you know, okay? And they won't let just you know, they'll let social media know. They'll let everybody know. They will burn it down, okay? And it may or may not be a bad thing. I have a lot of faith in Gen Z. You are gonna dig us out of this retention hole that we have dug for ourselves. You're digging it too, but whatever, that's a different story. All right, so let's talk about how we're gonna attract Gen Z. Gen Z is the first generation in history to be over 49% non-Caucasian. That's a big number, okay? Diversity is very important to them. Inclusivity is very important to them. They're gonna pay attention to this. They're gonna to want to work for employers that reflect this reflect diversity, reflect inclusiveness. And not just in skin color, race, ethnicity, in all levels of diversity. This is the generation that fights on every aspect, okay? Sexual harassment of women in the workforce, age discrimination, gender discrimination, LGBTQ discrimination, all of it, okay? They're paying attention to all of it. If you're going to attract and retain them, you have to be paying attention to it as well. How you're gonna develop your Gen Z talent, um, so we know they don't really have the best social skills. Maybe you can improve upon that, okay? Maybe you can offer them skills training. The most important thing to remember about Gen Z, this is the, this is the instant gratification generation. They want constant check-ins with their management, one-on-ones, okay? Constant feedback, how am I doing? How can I improve? They want to work and they want to perform, but they just need more feedback. Remember, iPhone generation, constant notifications, okay? Give them that. How you're gonna communicate with Gen Z? Some kind of text-based platform, Slack, Teams, texting, FaceTime, that's all preferred, okay? Um, and again, here's that stat about 4% of HR getting ready to not know what to do with these people. We can stand up here and bash our generations, and believe me, it's tempting to. Um, but we, what we should do is prioritize the rehumanization of each other. We're all going through different things. We all have different circumstances, different perspectives. We need to work together to solve this thing. When we're dismissing each other, we're rolling our eyes, this is who we have to work with, all right? You with me so far? Mm -hmm. Is this making yes. sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So we've achieved evolution, we've achieved empathy. Let's go into engagement. Guys, if you take nothing else away from today, please take away engagement. This is your most important E in the formula. I guarantee you. Any classroom educators in here? One in the back, sir, in the tie. Um, if I asked you what is the key to good classroom management, you would say? It's active, active, active learning and engagement. Active learning and keeping your students focused, right? Yeah. Nothing has changed from the time that we were students in school to the time now that we are adults pretending to know our jobs. Okay, nothing, you're listening. Nothing has changed. Where attention goes, effort goes. Okay, where our attention goes, effort goes. And if social media has taught us anything, where our attention goes, dollars also go. And so if our attention is not on work, where are our dollars going? In the trash. Guys, you lose $300 billion worth of productivity to disengaged workers every year. $300 billion are lost worth of productivity to disengaged workers every year. That's a lot. But what is engagement? My teacher friend in the back. What is engagement? Um, well, I mean, it, it's, it's having them actively involved across, in, in classrooms, having them actively involved in across the board, right? Active, active. Good. And do you find that your most active or engaged students are also your best students? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that shouldn't be a surprise. When it comes to engagement, especially staff engagement, okay, the more engaged we are, the better we perform. And by the way, not just individually, but as a company, okay, your overall staff engagement levels has a direct correlation to your company performance in three subsets. Number one, productivity. Number two, hey, look at that, retention. And number three, revenue. 
We've already discussed revenue. But let me give you another stat when it comes to revenue. If you have, if you are part of a company where your staff is engaged, you know how much more revenue you produce? 2.5 times as much revenue in companies that are engaged versus not engaged. We'll talk about retention rates in a second. But you want to talk about productivity? Engaged workers produce 57% more efficiency than non-engaged workers. I will prove this to you in this talk. What's the reward for good work? I heard it. In the more, work. more work. So in the blue, yes. The reward for good work is more work. We know this internally. As staff, as management, we know this. Oh look, I got somebody that's producing. Let me pile on. Hey John, you can stay till 5.30 today, right? Okay, we know engaged workers produce more. Yes, I can stay till 5.30, but those 30 minutes will be coming off my Friday, says the millennials and the Gen Z, all right? We know we produce more when we are engaged. And that's exactly what it looks like. You're, you're more satisfied with your job. You provide extra discretionary effort to helping your company get their goals done, to getting your own work done, or maybe helping your team or helping your department. That's what engagement looks like. Eight out of 10 executives will tell you engagement is one of the, if not the most critical things to their companies. And you know what's funny about this statistic? 80% rah, 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 yeah, 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 engagement. 60 to 65 of them, 65% of them, are measuring engagement. And they're measuring it once a year. They me yeah. yeah, they're measuring engagement once a year. And the rest, 35 to 40%, they're not measuring engagement at all. There's a huge disconnect here between what you're saying is important and what you're actually doing in reality, okay? And by the way, measuring engagement once a year, look, I agree, having one touch point throughout the year is better than no touch points, I agree but it's too infrequent, it's too slow. By the time you have dispersed your surveys, collected your surveys, interpreted your surveys, made a plan regarding your survey, it's too late. You have missed the window. Those problems are problems of yesterday. New problems have arose, okay? It's too infrequent, it's too slow. What you should be doing instead is sending out more focused and more frequent pulses, taking the pulse of your staff. At least once a quarter, that would be great. That's what you need to be doing. Again, going back to retention rates for engaged employees. Engaged employees are 87% less likely to leave you. Let me put it to you a different way. Engage, if you have engaged employees, you are giving them, you are leaving them with a 13% margin to even think about leaving. That's how big engagement you're leaving them with a 13% error to leave, to want to leave. This is huge. Okay, so you're probably saying, okay, fantastic, Robbie. How do we keep people engaged? What is the formula? Again, I got you. Step one, tie the work to meaning. We know meaningful work produces intrinsic motivation. On our job descriptions, I read it all the time as a recruiter, must be internally motivated. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> Must be self-motivated. To do what? <laughs> right? Only thing I'm self-motivated to do is get money and sleep. That's it. <laughs> okay? Self-motivated? Fine. Tie a passion into it. Tie a core value into it. Okay? Make it meaningful for me. Remember, remember millennials? The thing that they pay attention to the most when it comes to companies is their mission statements, their values. Are you standing up for something? Do you give back to the community? What do you do? Make it meaningful. The second thing you're gonna do is develop supportive orchestrators. Remember, not management, orchestrators. What should orchestrators be doing? Again, building autonomy. 10 minutes, perfect. Building autonomy. I sped through this thing. Building autonomy, okay? Allowing for collaboration. Allowing for support, building your future leaders of your organization. That is what your orchestrator should be focused on. That's what your talent pool wants you to be focused, focused on. Oops. Step three, create a positive work environment. <laughs> Shh. 
show of hands, how many of you think you're working a positive work environment right now? Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Let me put that to the test. Does <laughs> I'm nervous. You raised your hand. <laughs> there are four facets to a positive work environment. The first asset is, is your work environment flexible? Yes. Okay, we're off to a good start. Okay, is it relatively flexible? Chances are you're on a good start to a positive work environment. Is your work environment humane? Oh, of course, yes. I would hope so. I would hope so. Okay, we're still doing well, 50% 50, 50 so far. Okay, next step. Is your work environment collaborative? For the most part, okay, good, we're doing all right. All right, Flag Evolution. Finally, is your work environment inclusive? Mm. I heard some feedback over here. Okay. Maybe not as inclusive as we would like it to be, stop. Thank you. Um, maybe not as inclusive as we would like it to be. Maybe, maybe that's the one we have some room to do. But those are the four facets of a positive work environment. Inclusiveness, humanity, again, going back to the human component, flexibility, and collaboration. If you have those four things, chances are you have a pretty positive work environment, and good for you. Give yourselves a round of applause. That's excellent. That is excellent. I've had some rooms where I stop at number one, and that's it. I'm like, oh. <laughs> All right, chances are if you've done Nope, I still got one more to go. Positive um, productivity, growth and development. There are a lot of resources out there, career source is one of them, to help you upskill your talent, okay? To help you with that professional development and their growth. Guys, if we're gonna advertise there's upward mobility here, please mean what you say, okay? If you know your managers aren't leaving anytime soon and your frontline staff has nowhere to go, please don't say we promote from within. You don't. Okay, remember, your staff are paying attention to this. Gen Z and millennials, they're paying attention to this. Remember your Gen X staff, they're looking, for, they're looking for ways to professionally develop themselves, get to the next level. Please offer these growth opportunities and development opportunities. This is how you retain your talent. Robin King said it before she got up here. Okay? They had to find new ways to, to redefine what mobility might look like in your company. You should be doing the same thing. If you've done one through four correctly, you will land at step five, and that's building trust and relationship, not only with your staff, but also with your leadership. Guys, your staff is gonna know that you're doing all of this just for the sake of checking boxes and compliance. Please approach steps one through four with a genuine desire for interest in change, okay? Please approach it, approach it with some genuineness. They're going to know the difference. The genuine desire to change and make your workplaces better. That's how you retain your talent. Okay, steps one through five, there it is for driving engagement. Assuming you have evolved, assuming you've done a lot of empathy, assuming you've done a lot of engagement, if you're still falling short of the mark, you're still having some problems with retention, I got you again, right? <laughs> There's just a couple more things that I can give you to make this work. Let's tackle some people in the back. My people in the back, if I asked you for some non-financial benefits that you would respond to, what are some answers I would give them? Non-financial. Time off. Time off? That cost the company money, so no. Uh, <laughs> what else? Leadership. Leadership opportunities? Okay, I like that. What else? Flexibility. Flexibility. Okay, what kind of flexibility are we talking about? Schedule. Okay, I love that. Flexible schedules. Yes, sir. Uh, assuring your staff's not missing any family events, children's plays. Love that. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. No. <laughs> Thank you. I love that. Yes. He said, um, five minutes? Okay. He said, getting some time and making sure that your staff isn't missing important family events. Crucial. That doesn't cost too much. It's a very easy thing to do. Bringing in humanity back into it. Okay. These are some great, what non-financial incentives would you love to have? Let's get really creative here. Anybody? Uh, yes? Professional development, it'll cost somebody to... More professional development. That's my Gen X friend back there. Okay, what else? Uh, millennial. Mill millennial, really? <laughs> okay, that's good. What else? <clears throat> mentorship. Mentorship. Oh, I like that one. Mentorship. Take me to the next level. Yes, ma'am. I believe people 
people want to feel my or know that you appreciate them. And how can I make you feel appreciated? Get on me. I'm sorry? Recognize. Recognize you. Yes, that's the one I was looking for. Rewards and recognition. One of the most overlooked things we can do when it comes to retention. Guys, we just want to be noticed. Okay? Chances are we've been killing for you guys. Making all of your cake, meeting all of your measurements, all of your goals. And how about some recognition? It doesn't cost you anything. Okay? That's a big one. Thank you for bringing that up. So we have to get creative when it comes to retention. And so when we, want, when we talk about the workforce that we want, we have to, again, retention starts with us, retention starts with you, rehumanize. What would we want? What would keep us there? How many, go show of hands, how many of you have been at your company 30 plus years? Any 30 plus years? Robin King. Round of applause for Robin King. Right. Do I have 20 plus years in the room? 20 plus years? Got a couple of them. Round of applause, 20 plus years. Fantastic. 10 to 15 years? Okay, look at that, all right? So just ask yourselves, what have, man in the back, that raise your hand for 10 plus 15 years, what has kept you at your company for those 10 to 15 years? Anybody wanna share what has kept them at the, Robin, what has kept you at Career Source 30 plus years? I had the opportunity to learn for every 33 years I worked. Fan. She said she's had learning opportunities every year for the 30 years that she's been there. Okay? Huge. We can't estimate this enough. All right? This is the formula that you're going to follow. If all else has failed, this is what you're going to do. I got five minutes. I'm done. All right. This is it. Identify your priority. No, two minutes? Oh, shoot. Identify your critical talent. This is what we're wrapping up right now. Identify your critical talent. Okay? Who can you absolutely not lose? You know who they are. We don't play favorites. Yeah, you do, okay? You know who you can't lose. You know the valuable skills they bring to the table. Identify them. Explore non-financial incentives. We just talked about that. Explore financial incentives. Chances are you're probably already doing that. And finally, communicate all of this to your staff. Remember we talked a lot about communication today. Make sure you choose the right modes of communication. Okay, how do you identify your critical staff? Um, the easiest way to do this is with something called predictive analytics. guys. It gives me a migraine when, when companies say, we're not using our data. Why, yo? Why are you not using your data? Predictive analytics is the number one way to hone in, target in on your critically risk, most risk factor talent, okay? Those that are at highest risk for falling through the cracks or quitting or leaving, okay? Use that data. How do you use that data? Skip to step three, critical indicators. This is going to be very subjective to your business. Every business is different, we have different needs, we have different goals. You have to figure out what are your critical indicators. And by that I mean, what are the valuable skill sets your staff has that you need in the future? Do you need creativity? Do you need some kind of technical skill? Do you need some kind of social savvy? What has been making your company successful? Put those into a skills inventory, load it into your system, okay? Next up you're gonna do is a process and system analysis. What does this mean? It sounds very complicated, it's not. A process analysis is how work gets done in your organization. A to Z, every step of the way. Where are the bottlenecks? What departments are well-oiled machines? Who has the knowledge, okay? How does your system work? Exactly what it sounds like, system and process analysis. Feed that into your system. The last thing you're gonna do is supply and demand models. We saw a lot of supply and demand models at the beginning of this, this, um, this show, I was gonna say. The beginning of this day, Ken, Brad, Dolores gave you a bunch of supply and demand models. More so, dive into it just a little bit deeper. Supply and demand can be a lot of things. Where is the talent going? That's supply and demand. Um, what jobs are we gonna need in the future? That's supply and demand. Let me put it to you a different way. What jobs and skills are going to be irreplaceable in the future? Put that into your system, okay? That's the supply and demand model. These warning lights, if you've done this system correctly, they're gonna be like signals on your dashboard, right? When something's wrong with the car, something's wrong with your workforce system. It looks exactly like that, okay? Um, for example, if you're in food and beverage and you're losing a lot of cooks, and there's not a lot of cooks out there, warning lights will go off, all right? We talked about non-financial incentives a little bit. Uh, I, again, I don't have the time to go into this a little bit deeper. Get creative, just get creative. It doesn't have to be crazy. And by the way, company culture is one of the things that's often the most overlooked. Guys, casual Friday is not company culture. 
<laughs> Everybody has casual Friday or some version of it. That's not company culture. Company culture can be a lot of negative. It can be, do we have a culture of fear here? Are you afraid to speak up? Do we have a culture of being overworked and burnt out? Okay, if really take stock of your company culture, all right? Reformat it if necessary. Financial incentives, I'm not gonna take a dive into this either. Chances are you're already doing this. Extra wages, sign-on bonuses. Financial incentives are what I like to call bandages on a gunshot wound. Short, <laughs> it's a bit, I know, but short-term solutions. Effective, but for the short term, okay? Yes, you've stopped the bleed, but you haven't addressed the root of the problem. You haven't addressed the bullet in the hole, okay? And again, it may work for some generations, millennials, hello, but it's not gonna work for all generations, okay? And we could talk about more complex financial incentives like revesting and earnouts, um, but again, all short-term solutions. Finally, I wanna leave you with this. Career source flag will show your final counties. Wow, I beat you on the stops, man. I know I'm there, I know I'm there. You have a lot of industries there, a lot of great industries. And I know hospitality and tourism is a big one, retail is a big one, but you also have some more industries up here. Um, aerospace, cybersecurity, manufacturing, transportation. By the way, transportation is set to explode in the next five years. 35% growth. We're talking heavy truck driving, uh, heavy machinery driving, uh, warehousing and storage, set to explode in the next five years. Th that industry, the transportation industry, would be a great one to do a process analysis on. Where are your people going? Supply and demand models. That would be a great industry to know, okay? Um, manufacturing, we do a lot of boat manufacturing here, a lot of boat building. When we talk about skills-based recruiting, we need to move away from this years of experience recruiting model. Forget years of experience. That no longer applies anymore. Chances are you're having retention problems because of that. Skills-based recruiting, okay? I noticed a difference between the North County's boat building and the South County's boat building. You're building the same boats, you have different requirements. What's going on? You're South, you're requiring more advanced degrees. Up North, you need a high school diploma. What's going on? Which is it? Make it synonymous, okay? Chances are they don't need to be that crazy. All right, reduce the barriers of entry. Daytona Beach, I've had a wonderful time. I hope you have as well. Thank you.